This morning's message, as I was preparing for it, uh, a memory from my teens, teenage years, came back to me. And I was in high school. I was probably a sophomore, maybe a junior. And uh, it was morning. We had arrived to class, so we hadn't even had first class, I don't believe. And I was walking down the hallway and had my books, and uh, a kid named Todd came up. And I knew Todd. We were kind of friends. And he smacked my books out of my hands down onto the ground. I don't know why he did it, but it bothered me. And I picked up my books and went to class. And then the next period, though, in between classes, I sought him out. And I did I say I snuck up behind him and I smacked his books out of his hands down onto the ground. Well, I thought it was done at that point. Only the next period came, and I was in my locker changing out books, and he comes along up behind me, and he slams my locker closed while I was still getting into it, and he spun the dial, so I had to redo the combination and get back into it again. I was like, okay, all right, I see where this is going. So lunch finally rolled around, and we're in the cafeteria, and he's sitting at a different table with his friends, and I got up from mine and walked over to the table and, you know, you got the little lunch trays that everybody has and little milk cartons, uh, you know, little half pints or whatever they are. Uh, I walked up and I, his was open. I grabbed his half pint of milk and I squeezed it and kind of tossed it and spilled milk all over him. Todd stood up and I don't remember how I got to the nurse's office. Uh, <laughs> Todd was twice the size of me. Uh, he was a, a big kid, and uh, my friends told me later that he, he hit me once, and I hit the ground like a wet bag of smear. At that point, it was over because the adults uh, around intervened. But this morning's message, um, is we're kind of going to see that escalation, that, that revenge factor coming in today. And uh, I'm not sure I learned my lesson, but... I suppose God took something that was clearly wrong of me and, and used it for good in my life. I haven't been in a fight since. I'm grateful for that. Fortunately, I haven't always remembered that lesson. And throughout my life, the, the revenge has, has been an emotion that has passed through my mind several times over the years. And perhaps some of you, or, or maybe even many of you, would have to honestly say that you've let your emotions get the best of you too at times especially when it comes to, to getting revenge. But the account we're going to look at this morning is confirmation of what Scottish novelist Sir Walter Scott, what he wrote about revenge in one of his novels. He said, Revenge, the sweetest morsel to the mouth that ever was cooked in hell. Walter Scott, the heart of a Midlothian. And our passage this morning supports what Scott's thoughts were here. But there's more to it, and that's what we're going to see this morning. The truth is, revenge may seem sweet in the moment, but in the end it becomes a bitter pill to swallow. The truth is, confirmed by, by secular psychologists, uh, who have found that in the long run, revenge is rarely satisfying, and that in many cases, the person who exacts the revenge ends up feeling worse afterwards. And this morning, we're, we're still looking at the life of Samson, and we're in Judges chapter 15. Two weeks ago, we saw that Samson's life began with great potential, right? He had godly parents, and God blessed him and equipped him with the Holy Spirit. But as we saw last week, lust and compromise and, and anger had caused Samson to waste a lot of that potential. And if you recall, you remember that at his wedding feast, Samson challenged the Philistines with a bet, or with a riddle and a bet. And, and as we'll see fully this morning, that one impulsive act set off a series of events that were all about seeking revenge. As chapter 14 came to a close last week, we saw Samson leaving his own wedding feast to travel to the village of Ashkelon where he killed 30 Philistines. He took their clothes in order to pay the debt and he brought it back up to, to Timnah where the, the party was going on. And while all that was going on, his bride's father 
had given her to his best man, to Samson's best man, likely to avoid embarrassing his daughter and probably embarrassing his family name. But before we get into our passage this morning, let me ask, have any of you played or watched tennis? You're familiar with tennis, right? You've, specifically, do you know how the, the scoring goes in tennis? Just, just real quick, you have to earn four points to win a game, right? And they, everybody starts at love, or zero, zero, and then if you score a point, it becomes 15 love, and then you score the next point, it's 30 love, next point is 40 love, and then the fourth point, you win the game. Okay, with that in mind, this, this passage, or this, my message this morning is a, a game of tennis, is how I've, I've created it to, to help keep score of what's going on as we're going through chapter 15. Um, and with that, let's go to our passage, and I'm going to read just the first five verses to start. First five verses of chapter 15. It says, After some days, at the time of wheat harvest, Samson went to visit his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go in to my wife in the chamber. But her father would not allow him to go in. And her father said, I really thought that you utterly hated her. So I gave her to your companion. Is not her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. And Samson said to them, This time I shall be innocent in regard to the Philistines. I do them harm. So Samson went and caught 300 foxes and took torches. And he turned them tail to tail and put a torch between each pair of tails. And when he had set, them, set the torches on fire, he let the foxes go out into the, the stands of grain and, um, that the Philistines had all their crops and, and set fire to the shacked grain and the standing grain as well as the olive orchards. Point Samson, 15 love. Now, Sometime after he had left his bride at the altar, he goes back to her house, and he brings a goat as a gift to the father. It was too late, though, obviously, and we, we see that his wife is now married to another man, so her father, probably afraid of what Samson might do, offers another daughter to Samson, but that's not good enough. It wasn't good enough for Samson, so even though he was 100% responsible for leaving his wife at the altar, he decides to seek revenge against the Philistines. And he goes to great lengths to carry that revenge out. He got 300 foxes he has to capture. And he ties their tails together and, and puts a torch between them and then sends them out so everything burns up. All the crops of the Philistines burn up. I guess it's safe to say the grain bins at the Philistine co-op are going to be a little low this fall. Samson wins the first volley and takes the point. But this is only the beginning of the tennis match between him and the Philistines. Let's continue on to verse 6. Verse 6 says, or 6 through 8 actually, Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? And they said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. And the Philistines came up and burned her and her father with fire. And Samson said to them, If this is what you do, I swear I will be avenged on you, and after that I will quit. And he struck them hip and thigh with a great blow, and he went down and stayed in the cleft of the rock at Etam. Double fall, point Samson, 30 love. Double point is, it's a double point here because the Philistines, in tennis, when you're serving, if you throw the ball up and you're serving in the cross and your foot crosses the line, that's a fall. If you do that twice, the opponent gets a point. So, 30 love Samson, the Philistines. Why? Why in the world would their revenge of, on Samson be to go and burn the father and the daughter of the girl who he was supposed to have been married to? What impact could that possibly, could they have thought that would have on Samson? Well, they try to exact this revenge, Samson, an Israelite, and the revenge is against two Philistines. What's really interesting here, though, is that even though it really doesn't appear that Samson had any kind of close relationship with the father or, or the, the woman that he was married to, he still vows to seek revenge for their death. And we do know that in the big scheme of things, God is working behind the scenes to use Samson, Samson's anger, to carry out his purpose for what was the beginning 
If you remember back in the beginning of chapter 13, he was created in the womb to be the beginning to free Israel from the Philistines. But from a human perspective, Samson is totally driven by the act of his emotions. So, 30 loves Samson. Now, point against Samson, 40 love. Samson vows that he'll take revenge one more time, and then he will stop. But even if we don't know the rest of the story, what we've learned about Samson so far is enough to make us skeptical, right? In verse 8, we read that Samson struck the Philistines on the hip and thigh with a great blow. Now, in Hebrew, that's known as, a, as an idiomatic or, or natural expression. And we have many of these in our modern language, like things are up in the air if things are undecided, or a piece of cake if, it's, if something's easy, or it's going to cost an arm and a leg if something's expensive. Our modern expression here for, for their on the hip and thigh with a great blow would be, he took them behind the woodshed. Okay? So, point Samson, 40 love. Of course, now it's again the Philistines' turn to turn revenge on, against Samson and what he had done to them. And let's continue in verse 9. And we're 9 through 13. It says, Then the Philistines came upon, or came up and encamped in Judah and made a raid on Lehi. And the men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? And they said, we have come up to bind Samson, to do to him as he did to us. Then 3,000 men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Do you not know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? And he said to them, As they did to me, so have I done to them. And they said to him, we have come down to bind you, that we may give you into the hands of the Philistines. And Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not attack me yourselves. And they said to him, No, we will only bind you and give you into their hands. We will surely not kill you. So they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. Point Philistines. Now 40.15. The Philistines make a raid in the city of Lehi in Judah, and the, the name Lehi literally means jawbone, and we'll, we'll see the significance of that here in a minute. But now remember that, that God has raised up Samson to deliver his people from the Philistines. But when the Philistines come looking for Samson to take out their revenge, the people of Israel are all too eager to hand him over to him we get the impression that the Israelites had, had become so comfortable in their assimilation into the Philistine culture that they were no longer seeking a deliverer. And that's supported by the fact that for the first time in the book of Judges, the people hadn't cried out to God asking for a deliverer. And so Samson allows his own people to bind him and turn him over to the Philistines. You see the similarities here? Last week we talked a little bit about previews, how God uses previews. Remember, in chapter 13, Samson's birth was like a nativity preview to the preview to the Jesus nativity. There are a lot of similarities. And then we saw last week that there's very little between Samson's birth, which had a lot of information about it, and to the time that he was an adult. Nothing about his childhood. Kind of the same thing with Jesus. And here we see the Israelites, Samson's people, binding him and turning him over to the enemy. Kind of the same thing the Jews did to Jesus. Now, as I'm sure you can guess by now, unlike Jesus, Samson continues this never-ending cycle of revenge. And let's, let's continue in verse 14. It says, when he came to Lehi, the Philistines came shouting to meet him. Then the Spirit of the Lord rushed upon him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that has caught fire, and his bonds melted off his hands. And he found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and put out his hand and took it, 
and with it he struck a thousand men. And Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps upon heaps. With the jawbone of a donkey, I have struck down a thousand men. As soon as he had finished speaking, he threw away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramath Lahi. Game Samson. Once again, the Spirit of the Lord rushes upon Samson like he did last week with the lion, right? And he easily shed the ropes that his fellow Israelites had used to tie him up, and he grabbed the first thing he saw to use as a weapon, a fresh jawbone of a donkey. And once again, this would have been a violation of the Nazarite code that he was born to, not to touch dead things. And with that jawbone, he killed a thousand Philistines. But that's still not enough for Samson. He taunts the Philistines with a pun. And that pun's not easy to see in the English language. The Hebrew words for donkey and heap sound a lot alike. They're almost exactly the same. So when Samson says heaps upon heaps, he's essentially saying that he's made the Philistines into donkeys by using the jawbone of a donkey. And remember, these stories, they're written by Israelite authors. So it's not uncommon for there to be a sense of humor written into these. The Israelites would have seen, would have taken this as a, as a funny story about their enemy. Let's finish the chapter. We all know any strenuous exercise is going to make you thirsty, right? So quenched thirst. Verses 18 through 20. And he was very thirsty. And he called upon the Lord and said, You have granted this great salvation by the hand of your servant. And shall I now die of thirst and fall into the hands of the uncircumcised? And God split open the hollow place, that is, at Lehi, and water came out from it. And when he drank, his spirit returned, and he revived. Therefore, the name of it was called and Hakor, as it, it is at Lehi to this day. And he judged Israel in the days of the Philistines 20 years. Apparently, killing a thousand men makes you thirsty. Especially if you have to use the jawbone of a donkey to do it. And I, I think God used that thirst to remind Samson that his power came from God. And that he is only a man who could do nothing without God's power. So for the first time in the account of Samson's life, we see him calling on the Lord. And while he seems to do that only to get something from God, only to serve his own desires, he, he at least acknowledges that God is working through him. And God, in his grace and mercy, he, he grants Samson's request, right? He provides him water that he needs. And this chapter is the, the perfect illustration of the idea we began with this morning. Revenge may seem sweet in the moment, but in the end it becomes a bitter pill to swallow. This never-ending cycle of revenge between Samson and the Philistines didn't leave either side satisfied. And as we wrap up this morning, we can learn a lot from this passage that help us break this kind of cycle that we have in our own lives. First, as we, as we wrap things up this morning, the first thing is taking responsibility for our own actions. Samson had a habit of blaming others for his problems. He blames everyone but himself for the fact that his wife was now married to someone else, but he was the one who was completely responsible for it. He's the one who made the bet with the Philistines. He's the one who told his bride the answer to the riddle. He's the one who left the wedding feast and went to some far-off town to kill 30 people and pay off a debt. He had just acknowledged, or had he just acknowledged that it was all on him, then the cycle of revenge could have been broken before it even got started. Some of you here this morning might be angry at some situation in your life right now. Or think that, that it's someone else's fault but which is really, in reality, completely on you. If you stop and really think about it. Man, maybe, maybe you're mad at your wife or, or, or for some reason. 
But if you had stopped and maybe given her a few minutes of time to, to hear um, about a particular issue, maybe the issue wouldn't be. Or women, maybe you're, you're mad at your husbands because they, they aren't meeting your emotional needs, but so you're holding out meeting whatever need that they have. It's a back and forth. Maybe some of you are mad at your bosses. But the truth may be that maybe you just have not been a good employee at that particular job. Maybe you should have never taken that job in the first place. Kids. Some of you might be mad at your teachers or your parents. But the real problem is that you don't respect or honor them. Obviously, in, in some cases, there is blame on both sides. In almost every case, there's, there's partial blame on both sides. But the Bible is pretty clear that you need to look at your own faults first before you go blaming others for your problems. In Matthew chapter 7, it says, Why do you see the speck that is in your brother's eye, but do not notice the log that is in your own eye? Or how can you say to your brother, let me take the, the speck out of your eye when, when there is the log in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the log out of your own eye, and then you will see clearly that the speck, to take the speck out of your brother's eye. If you want to stop a revenge cycle or a cycle of revenge, dead in its tracks before it even begins, you must take responsibility for your actions. Second, be a shock absorber. When someone does something to hurt us, we need to be shock absorbers. Instead of getting all uptight and angry and repaying evil for evil, which we saw in the, the first Thessalonian scripture reading this morning, scripture says, don't pay back evil for evil. Instead, we should let things stop with us. And that's why Jesus talked about loving our enemies and turning the other cheek. Or as Peter reminds us, in 1 Peter chapter 3, the apostle wrote, Do not repay evil for evil, or reviling for reviling, but on the contrary, bless, for to those you were called, that you may obtain a blessing. Jesus was the ultimate shock absorber. Although he did nothing wrong, he willingly took on all of our sins and bore them on the cross. He is the ultimate example of what it means to repay evil with a blessing. And just like Samson, he allowed himself to be bound and turned over to his enemies. And just like Samson snapped those ropes, Jesus broke the bonds of death and he rose from the grave in victory over sin and death. In Jesus, God forgave our sins so that we can forgive others. There may be times when we have every right to exact revenge, but it doesn't mean that we should exercise that right. We can often bring the cycle of revenge to a, a quick end just by being a shock, shock observer. Don't retaliate. Number three, turn our energy into something good. Samson wasted so much of his potential by taking the strength that God gave him and using it to seek revenge rather than to do what God called him to do, which was free Israel from their bondage to the Philistines. It didn't have to result in war or death. in many ways to accomplish the mission. But before we're quick to criticize Samson, maybe we need to consider how we do the exact same thing sometimes. As I think back to the example that I shared with you at the, the beginning of the message, I realize how much energy I wasted developing a plan seeking revenge. I would sit in classes. I pay attention to the math teacher or the English teacher. I don't remember what the classes were. But I'm sure I sat in those classes trying to figure out where Todd was going to be in the hallway after the next class so I could go find him and do something to him. Waste of my time and energy. As I said earlier, I'm apparently a forgetful learner because I continue to allow myself to get sucked into a lot of 
the political arguments around, around these days. And, and that happened recently with my siblings, and it was a complete waste of time because there was nothing that I was going to say or do that was going to change their mind, and they certainly weren't going to change mine either. Unfortunately, God brought me to the place where I realized that just how much time and energy I was wasting and how damaging these back-and-forth tense experiences can be in relationships. And so I've, I've been working on using that same time and energy for things far more productive for God. Is it time for some of you to do the same thing? Number four, let our needs drive us to Jesus. We've been criticizing Samson a lot in this series so far, and with good reason, but, but we also need to give him credit when it's due. Even though he may have done it for selfish reasons, at least Samson let his thirst drive him to seek out God. And to be fair to Samson, we do see that there's at least some degree of humility here, as he acknowledges that it is God who granted everything that he's been able to accomplish so far. This is the one area where we can learn something positive from Samson. When we feel the need to seek revenge, instead of taking it into our own hands, we need to take it to Jesus. And once we do that, we can also, number five, leave the results to Jesus. Samson wrongly thought that he had to take everything into his own hands. And if we're honest... I think most of us would admit that we think like that too on occasion, more often than we should. In fact, any time we seek revenge, that is exactly what we're thinking and doing. But the Bible is clear. We are not to think like that. Here's what Paul wrote about that in his letter to the churches in Rome. He said, Beloved, never avenge yourselves. But leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. It may very well be that God won't ever exact the revenge that we think He should. But we can be sure is that God is 100% just and righteous, and He will ultimately do what is right. And perhaps the, the biggest danger with seeking revenge is that there is almost always collateral damage. People who have nothing to do with the conflict get hurt. In this account, an innocent woman and her dad were burned to death. And at least 1,030 Philistines were violently attacked and killed. I don't think any of us want to be a part of something like that. When Samson stood up and, and made his bet during that wedding, during the wedding feast, I, I don't think he ever imagined the cycle of revenge that was about to, to take place. And perhaps there are some of you here today that, that stand at a crossroads like that. Maybe you've been hurt and and like I did several years ago, you're maybe plotting your revenge. Or maybe right now you're already caught up in a cycle of revenge. At a minimum, if you're not in a situation like that right now, I can assure you that someday someone is going to do something to you and you're going to be tempted to take revenge. And I pray for you that you'll do whatever it takes to stop the cycle so that you don't ever have to experience that bitter pill that's hard to swallow. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Lord, we sometimes find ourselves growing in anger. We, we find ourselves craving revenge, relishing the thought of harming those who do terror and evil whether to us or someone we love. So we're desperate for you to apply these scriptures to our hearts this morning. 
It's one thing for us to long for justice, but an altogether different thing to want to repay harm for harm or evil for evil. Lord, we thank you for your commitment to avenge all evil. Thank you for your commitment to put all things right and to make all things new. And just as in the fullness of time you sent Jesus to be our Savior, so in due time the, the day of the Lord will come upon the kingdom of darkness. Help us use our energy for loving our neighbors and pushing back on the effects of the fall in our community. Help us to be more ready to share the gospel and speak of the hope you have given to us in Jesus. And we pray these things in Jesus' loving and triumphant name. Amen.